Hi, everybody. Welcome to one of the very first episodes in the revival of The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck, and I'm excited to welcome back to the show one of my first guests when I first launched The Sharpening Report around about six years ago now uh, at this point. My good friend and absolute brilliant researcher, Dr. Ken Johnson. He is the author of the Ancient Dead Sea Scroll Calendar and the Prophecy the prophecies it reveals, which deals with the amazing prophecies of the Essenes. And that's going to be the topic of tonight's show. And then we have a little bit of extra later on for members, and we're excited about that as well. But we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. Ken, glad to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Good to be back. We're doing real well. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so the last time, uh, last time that we were able to talk, it's it's been a while. It was uh, before the world kind of turned upside down with all of all of the you know the riots and the COVID stuff, and it, it's basically just a different world that we're living in now. And I, I think that when we look at what the Essenes saw in ages, which we'll get to that. I think that might help explain some of it, which is one one of the most exciting things to me. But before we really get into the meat of today's topic, uh, for those who, who might not be familiar, can you give the audience a bit of your background? Because you, you're not just some guy online with an opinion. You actually work firsthand with some of the, these Dead Sea Scrolls. You're involved in uh, translation work even. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and uh, what you do with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Sure. Basically, um, I went to seminary, was able to study Hebrew and look at a lot of different things, a lot of different scrolls as we had at the time. Um, and I've been translating. Uh, I, I started off looking at what the church fathers taught, the ones that were the disciples of the apostles, to try to get more information about the just the patterns, the history, the idioms, things like that. And then in 1996, uh, the theology part of what the Essenes believed and taught was finally released to the public. And so it's only been around about 20 years. Uh, But it's really interesting to look at that and see what they teach and how it compares with the New Testament. But I've been uh, writing for about 10 years. I have 33 books out. Wow. And on various things, prophecy, uh, just different things like that. But these days we're focusing on the Dead Sea Scrolls, trying to do the translations prophecy from them, history, theology. Man, that's absolutely fantastic. I have been, um, the past few days especially, I have just been binge-watching your channel, and uh, it's some of the most interesting things that I've ever heard, and it, it really helps put into perspective what was going on in the time of Jesus and, and, and before and how that relates to uh, the the Age of Grace today. So broadly, and and then we can get into some specifics later because there's a lot of really fascinating things, but just, just broadly, uh, when we talk about the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we, we, we know that they were uh, held by the Essenes. Who, who were the Essenes? Uh, the Essenes were the followers of the, Z- uh, the Zadok priests. And the way that works is uh, you had to be descendant of Aaron to be a high priest. Uh, later on, you had to, it, it, well, actually it starts with Levi. And then when Aaron came along, you had to be a descendant of Aaron. And then later on, uh, the Lord spoke through Solomon, made it a descendant of Zadok. So the Zadoks are the priests of Jerusalem. You and I don't sacrifice animals and stuff like that, but they did, and they had to do the law of Moses perfectly until the coming of Messiah. So that's basically, in a nutshell, who the Essenes are, uh, their followers, things like that. So what is the what is the history here? Now, how, how did the Essenes come to be? Because we have, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like we have this, the, the end of the Old Testament. You know, everything seems to make sense. Everything's good. Then the New Testament begins, and there's Pharisees and Sadducees, and everything's all different. Uh, what happened in that time period between the Old and New Testament? What's the, what's the history of the Essenes? Well, briefly, we have 400 years, and about the only thing we knew about it is what the Talmud says, which that's the Pharisee version of history. And they didn't really lie to us. They just didn't tell us everything. They made it look a certain way. And we just assume that what it says, unless it contradicts the New Testament, that it's probably correct, the calendar and their traditions and different things like that. But then when the Dead Sea Scroll theology was published in 91 or 96, somewhere in there, uh, they tell a different story. Their story is that <clears throat> God spoke and has always had prophets and has always had a system and a calendar and certain prophecies, and the Jews have always been uh, followers of that theology, but then it was prophesied that right before Messiah come, the two to three hundred years before, 
they would apostatize and just go mad, basically. Um, and so they said that's exactly what happened, and that's how the Pharisees and the Sadducees formed. So it's interesting. You'd look at that and think, well, it's, it's two separate factions. Uh, but as a Christian, I believe the New Testament. So the New Testament tells me what happened. So now I take New Testament theology and history, and I go back and I compare it to the Essenes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and I can see that the Essenes had it correct all the time. The Essenes believed, and they taught that you have to interpret the Old Testament by the writings of the patriarchs. Those are like a last will and testament written from Adam through Aaron. And the Pharisees said, well, that was true, but those writings are gone. And so you have to interpret it by the oral Torah. And so when you look at the differences, the Essenes said, okay, here's the deal. We have a sin nature because of what Adam did. The Messiah is supposed to come and die for our sins, and that reconciles us to God. The date when he comes will be 32 AD. It's one Shemitah after the ninth Jubilee of their age is on their calendar. And they talk about how the Pharisees would apostatize. There's going to be a virgin birth. The Messiah is God incarnate. He's not an angel. He's not just a man. He's not going to free you from the Romans. He's going to free us to have a relationship with God. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees said, no, the Messiah is just some guy that's a general that bumps Rome off and gives us authority, and that, that takes place. And so you have this dichotomy. But all the prophecies given uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls either agree with our interpretation of the Bible prophecies or their extra-biblical prophecies that we have found actually took place. That's that's amazing. In um in the New Testament we read a lot about, you know, the Pharisees, there's a little bit about the Sadducees there uh, as well. Um why aren't the Essenes mentioned? The uh the Essenes are basically scribes. And so the it it gets confusing because by that time there was still mainly Pharisees and Sadducees, but there'd already begin to be five or six different subgroups of Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and Samaritans and uh there there were Sakari, and there were a whole bunch of others. And so usually in the New Testament, they just call them scribes. Yeah. But scribes te technically can be the guy that, uh, you know, does the legal, like a lawyer, makes the legal documents up. Uh, they also copy scripture. So there's some of them that are non-sectarian. We're just Jews. Leave us alone. We just copy scripture. And then there are others that keep the temple library. And so they tell a fantastic story, a uh, history of how they got started and, and how everything happened. And there's actually quite a bit of information now. The 400 years are not silent anymore. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, what's really interesting is the fact that the way they detail prophecy and history, they basically said that it all started with um, <clears throat> when the Greeks took over the kingdom and then the Greek empire split. And Israel was owned, basically, by either Egypt or Syria, Egypt or Syria, Egypt or Syria. And it kept going 11 times like that throughout the ages. Egypt is, was pretty good to them. It's like, we're polytheists, we worship anything, you can have a temple, we don't care, everything's cool. And so the Seleucid Empire, though, to the north, the Syrian Empire said, no, you have to be Greek, you have to worship our gods, you have to use our calendar, use our money. Everything has to be done right. And we remember Antiochus Epiphanes coming in. And he said, you have to get rid of Judaism completely. I will kill every last one of you. And then the Maccabees rose up and said, no, we will not. Well, what happens is after Antiochus died, the new Silurian king said, I really don't care about religion. I just want money. Okay? So you use our money and our calendar to pay it on time and do whatever you want to in your temple. That's fine with us. And the Maccabees considered that a major victory. We've won. And the Zadok priest said, well, no, because you've got to use the right calendar. You know the law says if you mess up the Yom Kippur ritual, for instance, you go in there unprepared, do the ritual wrong, you're dead. Well, one way you can do it wrong is to do it on the wrong day. You just have to follow the calendar properly. And so the Essenes said, and this was part of the prophecies, it's in Jubilees and several other Dead Sea Scrolls, that they would abandon the solar calendar that God gave them for a lunar calendar of the pagans. And if you go back and you look, there's lots of different Greek calendars, but if you go back and you look at the Seleucid Empire's kingdom calendar, 
it is identical with the Jewish calendar we have now. The uh, the leap months when it starts, the names of the months are different, but the calculations are all the same. So it's fascinating. I would look at all the theology and say it's important. And as for me, I go by a Gregorian calendar, and I don't sacrifice animals, so it doesn't matter to me. I would think it's not a really big deal, but they said it is extremely important you understand the calendar. And now that I understand it, I understand why. There are extra prophecies and more important things in the calendar itself. That's fascinating. So so after the split happened, the Essenes settled in Qumran. Um, what were they doing after that? What, what was like their daily life like fr- in their community from uh, that time up to the time of Jesus? Well, they were keeping the rituals as they were supposed to. And see, this is the difference between a Zadok priest and, and just regular Essenes. Just like a regular temple priest would, would be at home, he was supposed to get married and supposed to have a child to carry on the lineage. But women and children don't go into the temple. And so that's why you don't have any very few people buried in Qumran, and the ones that are there are only priests. But they would go there, do the rituals, switch off like they're supposed to. They had the the 24 courses mapped out, and then they would go home to their people. And sometimes they had businesses and kids and wives and all that stuff. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. A lot of people think the Essenes were not married They were vegetarians, all this kind of stuff. No, they were following the law of Moses. But they said, one of of the prophecies, for instance, is that the Holy Spirit would allow them to go out in the wilderness somewhere and he'd show them. They're supposed to take the temple library, all of the scrolls, and there's a public canon. That's what we know as the Old Testament. New Testament hasn't been written yet. But in addition to the Old Testament, there were a lot of historical and prophetic works. And they took those with them. And the Holy Spirit revealed to their priests that um, there would be one of their order to fulfill the prophecy of the voice crying in the wilderness to make straight the path of the Messiah. And that's what they were waiting on. They had the date set. They knew what would happen. They knew how it would work. The prophecy of the virgin birth. They knew what generation it would occur according to the prophecies. And they were just waiting. And then when you go back to, I uh, like the... the um, Church Father Hippolytus, he actually has a record of the school of the prophets from the time of Moses up until the time they became Christian. And you can follow that lineage through, and John the Baptist is in there. So it's really interesting that he would have been the leader of the the school of the prophets, and it also talks about his school, uh, prophetic school and stuff, and how it got twisted up with the Gnostics, which is a whole other story. But all of that's going on, and of course, John the Baptist then comes and baptizes Jesus into the ministry, into the priesthood to do the things he's supposed to do, and fulfills that prophecy. So it's an amazing uh, whole set of things to go on. But basically, that's what they were doing, is keeping copies of the scrolls, waiting for Messiah to come. They taught that when Messiah does come, it would start the age of grace. The law of Moses would be set aside, exactly the same thing that uh, Paul teaches in Galatians and in Hebrews. And they explain it perfectly. What's really cool is there's a prophecy that when the um, age of grace begins, there would be a Benjamite that would write a series of epistles that would explain everything. And it would be in the canon of the Gentiles for all time, or the, the synagogue of the Gentiles. And so we know what that is. That's the epistles of Paul. And, and prophecy and some theology would be written by the Messiah, or would be discoursed by the Messiah himself. So they actually prophesied Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and the epistles of Paul. Wow. And they were looking, because Paul will explain everything perfectly. If you understood everything the Essenes did, Paul answers every question. Now, we look at it like we, we, re- we read Paul, and he answers most things, but he's got some really oddball things that we don't understand. So we're going back looking at the strolls, scrolls, to figure out what the questions were that he was answering so we can get the whole story. So it's it's amazing that way. Man, yeah, that and that that's one thing that really surprised me in watching your videos and and looking into some of this stuff myself is just how accurate these prophecies are. And and just, you know, for people at, at home that might be wondering there's no chance that that this stuff would have been written later or after this stuff was happened. Like it, like it's been verified that these these scrolls, these writings were uh, written before the time of Christ. Correct? Right. It's possible some of the scrolls might have been between thirty and seventy, but they were all gone from the community before the destruction of the temple. Mm. 
amazing. And you can date a lot of them, and even the Israeli Antiquities Department will date some of these things. Most of them are around 200 B.C. Mm -hmm. My favorite scroll is the Melchizedekian. It's 11Q Melchizedek. It's the one that says that the Messiah would come and die for our sins in 32 A.D., reconcile us to God, and then it begins to talk about other prophecies. Now, they don't like that a whole lot, but bottom line is it's dated at 400 B.C., period. Wow. I mean, there's just nothing you can do about that. And there's so many other scrolls that talk about the same stuff. I have a lot of friends now that are actually beginning to become, and it has it's been going since in the last 20 years, becoming Messianic Jews, because it's just a little, a little too obvious. I have one friend who is an Orthodox Jew, uh, studies the scrolls, and she's actually still rejecting the Messiah and thinking about going into Kabbalah. And so what's, what's happening, though, is that they're all saying that even if the Pharisees are right, they deliberately hid the fact that there was this wacky cult or whatever, you know. Why do they hide it? What, and, and they were so specific about it to hide every instance. There's actually a place in the Talmud that says you're under a rabbinical curse if you read Daniel chapter 9 and try to figure out when Messiah comes. You can't read Isaiah 53 because that might lead you to believe certain things. You can't read anything critical of the Pharisees, and that means Dead Sea Scrolls. That I can understand. And what threw me for a loop was the fourth thing. You can't read anything about a 364-day calendar. <laughs> That's the Essene calendar. So my first question is, what is so deadly about the Essene calendar that you're under a rabbinical curse for it? I mean, it's, what, what, there's got to be more to it than just a calendar. And there's some amazing things to it, all right. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, I definitely want to ask you about the calendar. Uh, before we do, to really like to, to really drive this home, the, the, the Essenes had a totally different relation to prophecy and the leading of the Holy Spirit than the Pharisees did. I mean, these, like you couldn't mm -hmm. be more opposite uh, than these two. So how, how did, like, the, the, it seems like the Essenes kind of viewed prophecy more like the way we Christians would if we're, I mean, if we're following it appropriately the way that it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to look at it that way, if you, if you understand it if you, as a Christian, if you knew what you knew now and you were back then, you'd be waiting for these signs like the veil of the temple being ripped, the star, a guy named Yeshua raising the dead. You'd have, you'd have all these together, and as soon as you see it, you would run to this guy and say, I want to be in your camp. What do I do? Yeah. You know, and that's what they were doing. And on the day of Pentecost... Uh, with what uh, the sermon Peter gave, it says thousands of them, and many of the priests, we're talking about all the Essenes converting to Christianity. <laughs> and so you can understand that. It's, we are them and they're us. Their theology is identical. Again, they, they believe Messiah was God incarnate, and they understood the Holy Spirit and the Father, Hashem. So they didn't use the term, but they were Trinitarian. And you can see this in their scrolls. And everything just like us, only we had no clue about this calendar. Other than that, I could understand everything. That's amazing. We, we also read about the, uh, the School of the Prophets and Elijah. So what happened with the School of the Prophets? How does that relate to the Essenes? Uh, the School of the Prophets could go anywhere and do anything, but they were protected by the, um, by the Zadok priests, and some of the priests were prophets and some weren't, so... But you, there would always be somebody filled with the Holy Spirit leading the school of the prophets. And usually they would write uh, prophetical uh, texts. And so Gad, Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, Iddo, uh, Elijah, they all wrote these things. And these things are kept in the temple library. And the, one of the prophecies given by Elijah was that there should be a public canon. And so that's what we have. It's just the 39 books. What's in there... The prophecies that are in there have some sort of a bearing on the end time of our age. And if it's a localized pro prophecy, it may not, you know, not necessarily put in there. So there's a lot of extra prophecies, a lot of extra history, uh, that kind of stuff. But the school of the prophets continued and then went with them uh, to Qumran is, is where that's going to be. They called it Damascus. They called it Second Damascus. And there's the Damascus Covenant, which you enter into if you accept Messiah when he comes. And so they use a lot of different language, but it's the same kind of stuff. But it continued up until the time of John the Baptist, and then um, we see Agabus in the New Testament. He was 
coming down from Antioch with a school of prophets or a group of prophets. And so according to the church fathers, it passed from there to Agabus. Agabus was still Jewish. Went from Agabus to Quintinius and then to someone else. And that's about the last we have of it. But the whole, the church fathers always talk about now you have to be a Christian in order to have the prophetical gifts, which Jew or Gentile, you just have to believe in Messiah. So it's, it, it fits perfectly with New Testament theology. Yeah, it really does. And and so if I under if I understood you right, um cuz I want to ask about Jesus, but uh so you you were so you're saying that John the Baptist himself w- was in a scene or a, a Zadok priest, is that correct? Yes, according to the yeah. records. Yeah, he was um um the the last few in in the in the list uh talks about it goes to Zechariah and then a guy named Joseph not connected with Mary, some other guy. And then it goes to uh, Caiaphas, officially. Uh, somehow he bought it or took it over. And they were saying they don't recognize Caiaphas and, Am- and Annas as being real priests because they were non-believers, flat out. They were just hired Roman people. So it would back up at that point and go to Joseph, who didn't have any kids. So then it has to back up to Zacharias and his firstborn child, which would be John the Baptist. So the order is clearly given in that sense. And so he's a Zadok priest. He's baptizing the repentance, the time of the Messiah is at hand. The place where John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan is eight miles from Qumran. Huh. So it's really interesting to see how everything is, is pulled together there. Yeah. But And there's a lot of stuff, too. Like, for instance, when, when people from John the Baptist came and asked Jesus, are you he who is to come or should we look for another? Jesus said, go back and tell John, one, two, three, four, five. And we look at those and think those are prophecies scattered throughout the Old Testament. And they are, except one of them is raising the dead. Right. And there's no prophecy about the Messiah raising the dead in the Old Testament. But there is a Dead Sea Scroll called the Messianic Anthology, which lists the prophecies or the things Messiah would do when he comes. Those are all written in order. So Jesus was actually quoting the Messianic, a Dead Sea Scroll. So he's saying John is in a scene, he knows the prophecies, he's got the extra biblical scrolls, go tell him, I have fulfilled every one of the Messianic anthology, and then ask him, am I the one? Wow. You know, that's what they do. And it's really cool to see that now, because it's like, it's an exact quote. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So there's several little quotes like that, you know, throughout the scriptures. Man, yeah, and I, and I saw the video. You've done a couple videos on that too, and it, it's just it's mind blowing stuff. Um, so so there's these three groups of people. Speaking of Jesus, there's these three groups of people in his time. There's basically there's Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, uh, mm-hmm. and it seems like they're grouped based kind of more on their beliefs, sort of like Christian denominations today. Now, I can't imagine that Jesus would be a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Uh, would would Jesus have been considered an Essene, or was he just something different? Yeah, actually, they they talk about the Messiah as being the teacher of righteousness. And in the records, in their theology, they talk about the teacher of righteousness came to Qumran and taught them for a while. I mean, he he's not the guy you learn that learns. He's the guy that wrote everything that exists. They recognize him as God incarnate, so they accept him right off the bat. And there's actually a talk in some of the scrolls about how um, they did it. They had like Yom Kippur on a different day and stuff like that. And so the Pharisees would come and yell at them and things like that. And then it talks about how the high priest is the teacher of lies, actually had the teacher of righteousness, the Messiah, put to death. And this occurred 40 years before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Wow. So all these things are dated, you know. So you know who we're talking about. I still got. I still have Jewish friends that say, "Teacher of righteousness." That must be the guy that started the cult. Like, yeah, that died forty years before the temple. Yeah, he's like three hundred years old. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, just read the text. It, it tells you who they're talking about. You know, but it's really fascinating uh, to look at all that stuff. So, yeah, they they accepted Messiah. John was there. Uh, Jesus apparently went there and taught. And so it's it's pretty amazing. Wow. I got one more question before we get to the calendar. Um, 
And I thought this was fascinating, too, because I think it's something that we can uh, learn from today, that the Essenes even had some trouble in their own group, and we see that kind of repeated in Christianity today. Uh, can you tell us about the three uh, sort of subgroups of Essenes that they, they broke off due to some heretical teaching and, and how we would find those familiar today? I mean, there, there's even uh, historians that I've read that try to paint all of the Essenes based on like some of these heresies and say all the Essenes were like that. But there was so there was like Gnostic stuff. But there there was um, there was three specifically that we're kind of seeing crop up uh, in Christianity today. People that you and I have both uh, had to deal with from time to time. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, and that's probably why they recorded it because a lot of these things repeat at the end of each age. The same kind of apostasy points. But the Essenes accepted Messiah, but there were uh, three major breakoffs. Uh, that they would, it's an excommunicatable offense. I don't think it's so much that you believe a certain thing, but you're ready to fight and die or kill for it. And that, that's, I don't care what you believe, you're gone. But there were three of them. One was what we call the party of the circumcision. And the basic teaching has always been, according to the Essenes, that Jews and Gentiles that are believers hang out together. You don't bother priests when they're on duty because they got to be ritually clean and all that stuff. But Gentiles ate non-kosher, they lived normal lives, even in the cities of Israel, and, um, and there's a lot we could say about that. But the party of the circumcision got confused. It started uh, three generations into the Maccabean era, and they decided we need to make all Gentiles Jewish. So they got to all observe Jewish t- tradition. And then they changed it around again, and they said all Jews have to observe Levitical law, so we all got to do the priestly stuff. And you can see this because the, in, the, in the New Testament, they'll come and say to Jesus, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders? And they eat you know, the food from on the Sabbath, and they don't wash their hands, and etc. Jesus could have said, because they're not priests, idiot. <laughs> you know? and he was more polite than that. It's like, you're making void the word of God. Mm-hmm. But that's what he means. It's like, do you know the difference between a temple and a cornfield? I'm sorry. <laughs> We're walking through a cornfield. They're not priests, and even if they were, they're not on duty. Why can't they eat corn? What is wrong with you? Well, it's the tradition of the elders. Yeah, that messes everything up, and they kill for it. You know, and so that's so. This party of the circumcision comes back or infiltrates Christianity in Acts chapter 15. So today we have messianic believers that believe it correctly. Gentiles do not actually. No one has to follow the law of Moses, but they do because it's their tradition. They want to use it to witness to other people. Gentiles are not supposed to convert. They're supposed to stay Gentiles. It's got nothing to do with salvation. So that's a messianic believer. And then we have Hebrew roots people that would say, no, it's it's important that all people convert and follow the law of Moses. And that's specifically forbidden, even in like Exodus. It makes it very, very clear. Um, so that's one one group. And they became the zealots and the sakari, and those are the people that would kill you if you didn't follow their way of looking at it. It's like the scrolls say all of Israel was walking in madness in those days. The other one is that they were, um, uh, we call it uh, uh, hyper-idolatry or pan-Babylonian, everything is pagan. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that uh, these guys would not even handle coins because on the coin is a picture of an emperor who's supposed to be God, or maybe Zeus is on there. So that means this is an idol. No, it's a coin, you know. But they're just like, they just go nuts with this stuff. And we have the same thing. People will say Christmas trees are pagan because they're Asherah trees. And we have documents now that tell you exactly what an Asherah tree is, and it's not a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, just do the research and all. But basically, if it is pagan, you and I are supposed to destroy it if we get you know, if we can buy it or whatever, we're supposed to get rid of all idols. Uh, but decorations are not idols. And there's a, a there's a document called the Avodah Zara that clearly explains that. But anyway, uh, the Pan-Babylonians, the, um, uh, let's see, who was the other one? Let's see. The the, sacred uh, sacred oh, Namers. Sacred Namers, yeah, there was the other one. And these guys, they said you had to use certain names for God and you had to use other titles for people, and you don't cross them. Remember, like, for instance, even today, Adon and Baal are two words for Lord. Mm-hmm. They're two different ranks in the, in the military in Israel today, so it's, it's just names. 
I can worship my Adon, and it could be pagan. I could worship my Baal, and it may or may not be pagan. Or Baal or Adon might be my husband, if I, you know, like Sarah called Abraham Lord. Mm -hmm. But they would say, no, 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 you got to say the names just right, or it doesn't work. Almost making it into a magic system. So it's like so what we call sacred names. Gamers, uh, hyper Hebrew roots, and pan Babylonians would be excommunicatable offenses, according to the Essenes. Really interesting. Yeah, it's 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 interesting how that's like repeating in our uh, time, which this actually leads to the calendar. And and so now that we've laid the groundwork of who exactly uh, the Essenes were and how they relate to our biblical studies, um, I really want to get into the calendar because that that's that's a lot of what your your new book is about. Um, what makes the Essene calendar so different from the Pharisaical calendar, and what's the structure of it? Because most people don't even really know much about the the Pharisaical. Calendar calendar. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what makes these things so different? Okay. Well, they're identical as far as like Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, but when does Nisan start? See, that's the main deal. And how does it, how do you figure that stuff? Uh, the Essenes said it's a solar calendar. The year always starts with the spring equinox, which on our calendar, since I'm a Gregorian guy in America, that's March 20th. Mm -hmm. It's always March 20th. That's nice. So March 20th is spring, you know, and then it goes forward. And what, they, what it does is our calendar is the most accurate when it comes to being fixing March 20th, the start of spring. But the, our problem is we mess up our weeks. So if I was to ask you, when is the first of the, the new year? You'd say it's January 1st. Well, is that on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday? Well, it depends. It's different every time. Mm -hmm. We mess our weeks up. Well, it's because we're a 365-day calendar. The current Jewish calendar is 354 because they have to start with a new moon. So every three years, they have to add a whole month. That really does not sound very accurate. <laughs> well, the way this works, it's a 364-day calendar, which is divisible by seven evenly in 52 weeks. So this year, Passover was Tuesday, Nisan 14. Next year, it'll be Tuesday, Nisan 14. And the next year, it'll be Tuesday, Nisan. And what's really fascinating about this is you'll go to places where Jesus is doing something or Moses did something, and it'll be this date. Five days later, something happened. Three, four, oh, I know what day that was. I know what day of the week it was. I, you know that was only three days before something else? You just instantly know things, and you, you all of a sudden start seeing patterns. And it's just really, really amazing. Um, but anyway, the way this works, let me flip over and show you this. Yeah, definitely. This is, here we go. This is an example of the uh, the equinox. So you can see here, mm -hmm. I think I can, I don't know if you can, there we go. Uh, it, we start up here with the vernal equinox, which is spring. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's one, two, three months in spring. They each have 30 days. Okay, and then there's three months in summer, three months in fall, and three months in winter. That's 360 days, and that's they talk about that a lot prophetically, and there's different ways to look at this. But the interesting thing about it is these are the days in the months, and at the beginning of each one, there's an equinox or a solstice. It's the actual first day of uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Mm -hmm. These are outside the months. So you have the first day of the year, the spring equinox, then you have 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, and then outside the months, you have the summer solstice, mm -hmm. and then the 30 days. So in other words, inside the months, there's 30, 360 days, 12 months evenly, and then there are four days outside that, and it's there's a lot to be said with it, but that's basically how it works, and so every spring equinox... Uh, you know, it, it starts on a Wednesday. New Year is always on a Wednesday. But the thing is, 364, every year then, you're going to be one or two days off. Right. And so they have a leap week. Once every five or six years, you add a leap week, and it puts you right back on again. Mm -hmm. So hundreds of years. It's actually self-correcting. Some of the information on how to do it we found in Josephus and several other things. So it's, it's really fascinating with that. And it's it's amazing how simple it is too because I've tried to like look into even the, like the current uh, Orthodox Jewish calendar that they use and 
I, I mean, I'm already bad at math anyway, but it's like it's kind of a nightmare for me to try to figure out. But uh, the Essene calendar just seems to make a lot of sense. You just got these four divisions and they're, they're days that are set apart out of the months and you got three months inside of each of the four sections. And it, it makes sense. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing, too, how vitally important uh, this calendar was. I actually thought this was funny in your book. You mentioned uh, the number of high priests before the change in the calendar compared to after and as it, as it turns out there were way more priests uh, after the pharisees change in their calendar can you tell us about that yeah it's really spooky because you've got some priests that are ruling for 10 20 30 years they're supposed to rule or do the priesthood from like 20 to to retirement at 50 or 60 and but so they a lot of them do this maybe 40 50 years and then they retire or whatever and then they mess up the calendar and in 150 years, there's over 300 priests. Well, that makes it, and I'm sure Rome pulled people out and put new people in and stuff like that, but still, 300 in over 150 years, that's almost like a new priest every six months. Yeah. You know, and it makes it sound like they went in to do Yom Kippur and they had to drag them out. Now, there's no record necessarily of that, but then again, if I was the Pharisees, I wouldn't make a record about that. So, so can, can you explain that for, for people who might not be familiar with uh, what we're talking about with Yom Kippur and uh, just kind of how stringent the rules were and, and what the consequences were if uh, the priest didn't do it exactly correctly? Yeah, the priest had to do a ritual with uh, the killing uh, and the sprinkling of the blood of a bull for himself and then goats for the people. It was a whole elaborate ritual, and once a, once a day, once a year on Yom Kippur, he would go in before the Holy of Holies and before the Ark. And that's in the presence of God. And you had to be covered with your sin or you would die. That's what the text says. And they had the tradition of a rope around the foot because you don't want to go in there. So he goes in there to do the ritual. And if all of a sudden, the, you know, the bells on his robe stop, then you know to pull the corpse out. And so that was, it was set up like that. It's very, very serious. You don't want to do the ritual wrong. So even if these guys were doing the ritual right, Doing it on the wrong day is still doing the ritual wrong. Mm. And so that was the spooky part. And if, if you've been high priest doing this for 50 years, I guess you're okay, right? But if you do it in six months and he dies, you elect a new one and then he dies, something's wrong. You know, and it should be an indication that the, the calendar is is messed up or not being used right yeah no kidding so, sometimes people are stubborn and they won't get the hint it's like you know how many more priests have to does god have to take out before the, they'll get it um th this was interesting too there's actually two more festivals uh that most people aren't aware of that the essenes had but the pharisees didn't can you tell us about those yeah it's really it's, it's fascinating actually and that's probably the heart of why this is forbidden knowledge because when you look at this all of a sudden like like Daniel 9 and Isaiah 53, it's pretty clear. And the deal is we have the festival of first fruits of the barley harvest, and then we have what we call Pentecost. And we call it Pentecost because it's 50 days from the barley harvest, so we just assume that's one. Well, there's actually four festivals that are 50 days apart from each other. They're all Pentecosts, so to speak. And we didn't know about the other two, but now that we know what they are, it's it's the festival of new wine and new oil. And if you look careful through the Old Testament, you see it everywhere. It's, you know, and it's mentioned in other scrolls, so it was obvious, like in Judges, that they did the ritual, and it tells you what they did and how they did it and things like that. So we just weren't paying attention. But the amazing thing about it is you have uh, first fruits of the barley harvest, and then 50 days later you have a festival called Shavuot. And they assume that means weeks because there's 49 weeks or seven weeks, which is 49 days. Then the next day is the 50th day. So that's probably how it got its name. No, that's not correct. Shavuot means, it, a Sheva means seven, but it also means an oath. And it's actually the festival of oaths is what it's supposed to be. But they kind of changed the name to get away from that. The tradition is that Adam entered into a covenant with God. So did Noah, the Noahide covenant, Genesis 9. The law of Moses was given to Moses, all of these on Pentecost. And the, the uh, covenant that Abraham entered in was a Pentecost. The covenant that the Age of Grace people would enter in would be on a Pentecost. We see that in Acts chapter 2. 
And then they say that when Messiah comes the second time, the very next Pentecost, we will be able to enter the covenant of the age of, of the kingdom. So these are the times when you rededicate yourself to the Lord. So as Christians, every Pentecost, we should be going forward and rededicating ourselves to the Lord. Even if we didn't sin or anything, what do I want? What does the Lord want me to do this year? This is a whole new year. We're starting over. Let's do what the Lord wants us to do. But the other two that were totally hidden from us is new wine and new oil. And the oil symbolizes the light of prophecy. And uh, the um, wine is like marriage. And this is what's amazing, too. When you look at John chapter 2, Jesus went into Cana of Galilee for a wedding. And it specifically says it was on the third day. Third day of what? Well, you don't need, you would know if you knew the calendar. The third day of Av is the festival of new wine. And that's normally when a lot of people, like we have June weddings, it's the tradition. A lot of people would get married on the festival of new wine. So Jesus, if this is his first miracle, you might as well do something connected with the festival that teaches prophecy, like, oh, I don't know, changing water to wine or something, you know. And it's amazing, you look at this, and, and you, it's like, I know what day it happened on, I know what year, or, you know, I know I know everything about this, and I know what the symbolism means, I can guess what he's going to do, yep, he did it. You know, it just shows you so much more, just because we know the calendar. But think about this, if this is a, is a whole thing put together, just basically, uh, the festival of uh, barley teaches us on the new birth. You, you, you have a physical birth, you have to have a spiritual birth. So that's important, whatever that means, you know. Pentecost is entering into a covenant, and the covenant sign is the Holy Spirit coming upon you. So obviously the Holy Spirit's power. New wine symbolizes two people, two adults that are finally grown up and become mature, get together and reproduce. So this is two new people, Jews and Gentiles, coming together as one in the Messiah and creating a new man. That's what the ritual points to. And then the, the festival of oil uh, talks about the light of prophecy. Prophecy is literal. It means exactly what it says. And if you agree to that, you're not pharisaical or Sadducee. But all these together, that means we've entered a new age. And you know what? Pharisees don't get to tell me what to do anymore. I bet that's the problem. You know, so it's really interesting to see that, but to look at all these things together, you know, Peter says that uh, you need to focus, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and you need to take heed to it until the day star dawns in your heart, the light of prophecy. So those are all references to the solar calendar, to the prophecy, to the lamp, and we've got a ton of, of um, parables about the weddings and the oil and the light and the lamps. And those are all connected with these things. So it's really fascinating. Yeah, definitely. You touched on this, too. This was one of the most exciting things for me, um, the, about the, the four ages that the Essenes believed in and, and how, they, how these ages were split into Jubilees. And uh, what, what can we learn about our current time by looking at what, what were the four ages? How were they split up? And where, where are we at well, there was supposed to be an age of chaos or an age of creation, and it's the first 2,000 years of human existence, and so it's from creation to whatever the 2,000 marked, and that was the time of Abraham. <clears throat> During that time, there was a major apostasy led by an antichrist named Nimrod with a false prophet named Anuki that was trying to kill the Messiah picture person, which is Abraham. And Abraham succeeded in destroying the empire, slaughtering Kedoliomer, fulfilling prophecies, at which time Melchizedek realized, yep, this is him, and anointed him. And so that was the end of that age. And then 2,000 years later, in the year 4,000, would be the end of our age. The Messiah would come, start the age of grace, certain things would happen. And then the Dead Sea Scrolls, like 11Q Melchizedek, will tell you exactly what year that was, period. And so, and it agrees with all the other calculations. Then 2,000 years later, the year 6,000, the kingdom age was supposed to start, or is supposed to start, and there's some major prophecies about that. But the 100 years, like before and a little bit after the end of these ages, amazing things happen, all sorts of miracles and things. And we've already seen 
uh, Israel come back, take back the Temple Mount, the Sanhedrin, the Temple getting ready to be built. We've seen all these different things uh, coming together for the end of our, our age. So that's what they taught. And up until now, anyway, they've been 100% accurate. Uh, so it's it's really amazing to look at and plug in the dates, the times. Let me share one thing with you. Yeah. Uh, we did we did the book, uh, Dead Sea Scroll Calendar, and then now that we understand how we did it, we created this website. I have to turn it on here, and it's dsscalendar.org. And what it does, if you can see here, we have uh, the Dead Sea Scroll date. So today, right now, it's. Uh, uh, the 16th of Tishrei, 5945. Uh, Gregorian date, it's October 1st, 2020. And weekday time, it's Thursday, 540 Israeli Standard Time. If I refresh this, it may be different. So, yeah, there we go. Anyway, so it's almost midnight over there. And then the Pharisee date, which is the normal Jewish date, it's Tishrei 13, 5781. And there's a whole section in the book, and, and you can see this in the Seder and other places. There's a, an entire history of how and why they changed the date, the year, because of Messiah, the what they considered the false Messiah. There's a rabbi named Yoshi that did it. So all this stuff is documented in their histories, which is pretty amazing. So and then we've got uh, uh, videos and books about it. But if you come over here, you've got full calendars, and you can type in a year from 1900 to 2100. So when Israel became a state in May 14th, 1948, you can figure out when that was, or when when was your birthday? July click 1st, 1984. This. Yeah, so we can click on that and see what it what it was. Cool. So here is the current one, which is uh, March 2020 to 2021. Mm -hmm. So if we click on that, this is the current calendar, and it's a whole year's calendar. So you can see it's 2020. 5945, it's Nisan, and the Tikufa is outside of the, the calendar month, and then the first is the Day of Remembrance, which is New Year's. And you can see Passover, again, is on a Tuesday, 14th of Nisan. And it goes through, and there's a lot of interesting things on this. So if Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples that night on Tuesday night, and then the next day was hung on the cross, and was taken down and put in the airtight tomb before the 15th, which is a high holy day. He's in the tomb Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, and he resurrects sometimes Saturday night. Huh. Okay? And yeah. in the, the Gospels, they come Sunday morning, and he's already resurrected. So that, that explains, explains the three-day three thing. Nights. Yeah. So this explains an awful lot of things in here, but you can come and look and see all sorts of different things in here. But I just thought I'd show that, share that with you. Yeah, that that is really interesting. And I've been, you know, the past few days, I've been uh, on your website just looking up different dates and looking to see if, you know, any interesting historical things happened on, you know, feast days or whatever. And it, it's 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 really interesting, super easy to use. Um, mm -hmm. But but you mentioned something that, you know, the, the end of the ages, some amazing things happened. So the Essenes knew the end of their age was coming, which actually, you know, if we think about it, it puts Matthew 24 into a lot clearer uh, context. I mean, it's like reading that oh, yeah. brand new. Um, and they so they knew they knew that this uh, a new age was about to start. But the actual year of it, uh, it, it seems kind of difficult to, to pin down. It seems like we have like 32 AD or 75 AD uh, as possibilities or possibilities. Sometimes you know one age begins before you know the previous one ends. How, how does all that work? How, what what happened from 32 A.D. To, to 75 A.D. that actually ended that previous age? And how do we look at you know wh which one of those years would be the actual end of an age and the beginning of the next? Yeah, and the main reason we want to do that is because we want to try to figure out when the Messiah is coming, you know. Right. And so that's, you know, the whole idea. We may be able to figure that out, not the rapture, but some of the other things. But the thing is, it's kind of like a timetable. The actual end of the age, according to theirs, was 75 AD. But Jesus was born in 2 BC, died in 32, uh, had his three-year ministry. The church began in 32 with Pentecost, obviously, according to their theology. And then 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. 73, the temple was destroyed in Alexandria. Then 75 was the end of the age. That was the covenant of Yavne, which actually ended 
the sacrificial order. They decided that that would be over. But then you've got later on the Bar Kokhba rebellion and then the dissolution of Israel in 135. So like I say, 100 years before and 60 years after that whole time period, you've got all sorts of things happening, all sorts of miracles and things going on. So there's a specific age, and you can see this. Abraham is called by God to start what he's supposed to start at the age of 52, and that's the exact year 2000. Now, I'm not talking about going down into Canaan, which is different, but to start doing the stuff in Babylon to destroy the empire. But it takes him like 60-some years for everything to get, and it goes way past that. So we don't want to be too anxious to jump on a date. Now, a date is set, and it is going to be what it's going to be, but that doesn't mean the rapture or the second coming or anything in particular happens. The exciting stuff we're looking at still are, is, is around. You know, The only thing we know for sure is that there's a seven-year period, and it ends with the second coming because the Messiah has to destroy the Antichrist. So those are connected. And so we have to f try to figure out the rest of it. But it's really amazing to look at this. And that's why we get 5945 because that's just 2,000 years minus the current year. So hmm. pretty uh, pretty interesting in that. Yeah. So right now, so we're we're – we're about five years away from like the final jubilee because these these right. ages are split into like sets of jubilees, right? Right. So, yeah, each age is two thousand years, except mm -hmm. the last one is only a thousand, which is the Sabbath. That's what the Sabbath teaches us: six years of man's history in a millennial reign. So, in man's history, there's three ages, two thousand years apiece. Each age is divided into four pieces. They're called unas or periods. It's a 500-year period, and in a 500-year period, you have 10 jubilees of 50 years apiece. So you've got four, um, uh, 49 years, which is seven times seven weeks, and then a jubilee afterwards. So there's uh, uh, two jubilees is 100 years, not 98. Mm -hmm. And that we see that in all the different calendar systems and everything in the scrolls. But that's basically how their calendar works. So today, if we got the right one, you'd say it's the whatever age, uh, the whatever Ona, it's the whatever Jubilee, in the whatever Shemitah, and the year. Wow. Yeah, the month and the day, you know. So in the, in the last, the, the previous age, you know, each age is 2,000 years. Um, so it seems like, you know, by the Essene calendar, we're coming real close now to the end of uh, our age, you know, the, the age of grace. And, you know, <laughs> like, like you said, and I totally agree, we don't want to set dates too specifically or anything. Um, but we see, like, in the, the way that the, la the, the previous age happened, uh, the around the beginning of the final jubilee was like the beginning of Jesus' ministry, somewhere around there. You know, if, if mm -hmm. 75 was the end of that, you backtrack 50 years, that would be about 25. So a couple of years right. after that, you get the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So at that time, like at the beginning of that final jubilee, you had a lot of things happen. But then at, yes. the, at the end of the final jubilee, which would have been the end of the age, you have the destruction of the temple, you have the council of, uh, y y what, what was it, Yavne? Yavne. Yavne, yeah, which which that was like the final nail in the coffin of the uh, of, of Israel and the whole the whole setup they had there. That was that was like officially the start of the age of grace. Even though you know, like we said, there's some overlap because we would say you know when Jesus died on the cross that that was the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So if we look at all that, you know, we're we're coming right up right up on there. I mean, 2025 would be you know in our years that would be the start of the final jubilee of this age according to the Essene calendar because then mm -hmm. 2075 would be the the final age so is it you know again we're and we're not getting too specific about when to time things but is it reasonable for us to kind of just generally look to years like 2025 2032 2075 um and and figuring that we have to have a seven year thing in there too somewhere is is it reasonable to look at those as possible years of the rapture return of jesus or the start of the tribulation you know how, how might we look at at the near at, at our near future? Yeah, basically, uh, I think we can do that. Um, Twenty five A.D. thirty two. All of those are in the ballpark of when those things happen. Just looking at the previous age, you can kind of see those things. So whether or not the rapture happens in twenty five, twenty five, I think is going to be really interesting. It's the start of the last jubilee. We are going to see some major persecutions. I think maybe not necessarily here, but somewhere. 
we're going to see some major miracles and some major prophecies fulfilled, maybe even in the next couple of years. But just looking at all that, there are some scrolls that uh, talk about the different things like that. Like, for instance, in the end of their age for the first coming, there's that 40 year period. And it talks about that being a period of persecution and repentance. For believers, they get persecuted. For, for non-believers, they persecute. But there's that time to repent, at the end of which, if you don't repent, you're done. And the temple was destroyed and that kind of stuff. But it keeps talking about the 40-year period and their time period. And Abraham's time period, at the end of his age, it was larger. And there's two different scrolls that talk about, at the end of the next age, the same thing is going to happen. And it's going to be a seven-year period. And it talks about uh, like a, a sign of someone with a mark on their forehead, and there's a, but it's fragmented. But just the fact that those things exist and they knew about them. Ninety percent of the prophecies and everything is all about their time, first coming. But there's all these other things. So if we can pull it together, and like I say, we've already seen some amazing things. We're going to see some amazing things in the near future. Man, I and I can't wait. I can't wait for that. Um, you you know me. I'm a pre-trib rapture dispensationalist guy, you know, and you you are too. So we're in agreement on that. And uh, this has been, you know, the, learning about the uh, Essene calendar and these different ages. I mean, that's been just so exciting to me because of the time that we're living in, and, and really how close these things very well could be. I'm hoping it's not. 2075 because i'm going to be in my 90s by then and i don't know if i'm going to make it that long <laughs> yeah me too yeah <laughs> well even if it's 2075 minus the seven year tribulation period it's got to be before that yeah. so it's before 67 yeah you know, remember yeah. isaac newton said it was 61 or 67 something like that so. yeah yeah that's true R really really strange um do you do you have a, a few minutes to answer some questions for the members only section sure. before we wrap up all right excellent well we're definitely going to talk more um but we're uh, for the audience we're going to do that in the members section at dailyrenegade.com uh so everyone on this channel please consider going to dailyrenegade.com and getting a membership uh we do have free memberships available Available, but you won't get the rest of the episodes. You can just be, uh, you can take part in the, the the fellowship with the other members and things like that. Um, but if you get a, a, a membership for the rest of the episodes, you you won't only get the rest of this episode, but you'll get full episodes of Peck Report, The Christian Marauder with uh, Brian Melvin, Detox Babylon with Mike Stibbs, which is a documentary series, uh, Christian Contrarian with Gary Wayne, and so much more. And we're doing this because uh, for those who don't know, uh, YouTube got in the habit of deleting our videos if we talked about Jesus too much. <laughs> and um, so I even had my main channel completely deleted. So that was eight years of work and history gone. And I was never able to convince YouTube to bring it back. So I knew that uh, we had to create a place where we could control our own content and wouldn't have to worry about censorship. Um, however, that kind of endeavor uh, costs a lot of money that I don't have. So Daily Renegade is really something that the Christian community who's interested in, in this, we can all pool our resources together and build something that the world can't destroy. It's also a place of friendship, fellowship, and family. We have message boards and ways for members to connect with one another. It's a, it's a really great group, and you'll feel right at home with us. So again, head on over to dailyrenegade.com uh, and get a membership if you're able to. In the uh, members-only section, we're going to be talking with Dr. Ken Johnson about the Melchizedekian priesthood and how that relates uh, to the Essenes' Dead Sea Scrolls prophecy and our role as Christians today. So Ken, before we uh, close out for people viewing for free, where can they follow you? Where can they get your books? Where can they watch your amazing uh, Bible and Dead Sea Scrolls study videos and everything else? Where can people find you online? Well, BibleFacts.org, I think you can see it here, uh, is the best place to go to. And from there, you can go to our Facebook page or our YouTube page. YouTube is the main place where we hang out. We have a study on Monday nights and a uh, Q&A on Thursday nights. And so, and we do lots of studies with Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that. And you can send me emails. If you participate on Thursday nights, you can ask questions and hopefully get answers. 
Excellent. And and to my viewers, I'm telling you, if you like if you like anything that I put out, if you if you're uh, following me for some reason, you, you've got to go. You've got to go check out uh, Dr. Ken Johnson's material. You'll be blown away. Like I said, I have been uh, binge watching this channel for the past few days now. It's pretty much constantly on on our house because there's so much material and so many uh, just amazing things to learn. But it's not like it's a new doctrine. It's it's the same doctrine the Bible teaches, but it fills in a lot of the blanks that we might not have access to otherwise all right so we're gonna call it uh we're gonna call it there for people viewing for free thank you so much for joining us on the sharpening report members hang on the line and everybody else until next time take care and god bless